Welcome back to Monumental, a small show about the big things God does in the lives of ordinary people. I'm Katie Walker, and my guest co-host today is someone I'm excited to bring back. If you've been listening to Monumental from the beginning, you'll remember Michael Crum. Michael and I co-hosted Monumental together in season one, and so I'm really excited to have you here with me, Michael. Thank you. Thrilled to be back. Yeah, it'll be fun to do this again together. Well, tonight we are interviewing your mom again. And again, if you've listened from the beginning, you'll remember Mary Lee Bailey, Michael's mom. We interviewed her in season one about caring for her aunt Elaine. That's right. So today we're going to be talking to my mom and hearing her story about the home that she grew up in. She was born in the 50s into what many would consider to be a picture-perfect family and then was growing up in the 60s and 70s during the sexual revolution and in many ways really embraced feminist ideology. And then that was a major stumbling block for her and my dad as they got married themselves and started a family and began in ministry together. So we're going to hear the story of how that happened and and then how God brought her out of that and changed her heart about all of those things. Mm-hmm. So great. Let's get into it. I was born in Wheaton, Illinois. I was born in 1955. I was the ninth of 10 children. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, my dad worked in Chicago. We were raised in the church. We were there you know, every single Sunday. I mean, I just don't remember anybody ever being sick and my mom ever (laughs) staying home because of a sick Not allowed to get sick on Sunday. Well, I mean, you are one of the youngest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, I'm sure there had to have been some, you know, weeks through those years, but... um, I mean, you've said before that if the doors to the church were unlocked, yes. you were inside. Yeah, hmm. yeah, hmm. yeah. So we were there. So not just Sundays, but through the week. Yeah, well, right. So Sunday morning, of course, church, we sat in the second row, filled an entire pew uh, <laughs> in the second row of college church in Wheaton. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then we would be back, back in the evening for um, evening service. And then Wednesdays, uh, midweek programs. And we often did things, you know, especially the youth group age. We did a lot of things together socially. Mm -hmm. That was our core group of friends was just at church. Was youth Um, group as opposed to, you know, school friends or or soccer team or whatever. Right. So on Sundays, uh, we did not even change our clothes. And back then we had something called Sunday clothes. Okay. <laughs> and then, but you know, those were really the dresses you only wore on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We would not change out of our Sunday clothes after church, which I think, again, today, you know, if people even have anything special to wear Sunday morning, they get home and change them. Right. Okay. We did not change our clothes because Sunday was a special day. Okay. You know, so it wasn't of, even just about because you were going back in the evening. It was like right. that whole day was right. going to look and feel. But we actually did not play with the neighbor kids on Sunday. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, were you allowed to play outside? We did a little bit, but it but wasn't. Just like in but, your you own. know, but again, you've got your Sunday clothes on. You yeah. know, so mm-hmm. it's just a you different. You to play in the same way. Yeah. 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 yeah it was a you know, rough and double. Never stopped my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> so, trying to get grass out of uh, white tights, you know. <laughs> okay, but let me tell you something else. About the 50s, there were something called blue laws in most communities, I believe. Now, in Wheaton, they stayed um, current longer than, you know, most places. Mm-hmm. But the blue laws made sure that stores were closed on Sunday. Mm-hmm. So we'd never shopped on Sunday because my parents wouldn't have any way, but literally there were no stores open. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that was um, just another thing you don't, you went into the weekend prepared for Sunday, yeah. you, didn't, you know, stop at Walmart on the way it's home. Cool, course, actually. You know, yeah. Walmart didn't exist, yeah. but whatever. Yeah. Because of the size of your family, did, I imagine you must have attracted a lot of attention. Did people, did you ever realize that as a kid that we, people were um, kind of pointing and yes, talking about you? Yeah. And it was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, okay. You do remember. But yeah, there was kind of a fun thing that we did do, though, where we would go on family vacations every summer, which, again, not uh, we we did not know many other families that did do that, mm. took big, you know, mm. camping trips, drove across country. <clears throat> but we would, so we always had these big, huge vehicles. Somebody had donated a 1948 limousine hearse to <laughs> my parents, and that was what we drove around in this huge black, you know, 
thing well you know and it was old anyway and it was embarrassing and so, was embarrassing. <laughs> so you know but when we stopped at gas stations um uh, on these trips across country and you know you just all these kids just start piling out piling <laughs> out you know and you would watch people's eyes you know it's like you know getting wider and wider it's like how many kids are there so we would just start to yell 10 there's 10 of us <laughs> you just own it yeah embrace it right right let me tell you one more thing about us growing up because um, it was, again, it was very unusual. But we had family devotions every single night. Okay, after dinner, you went immediately into the living room and sat around the whole, everybody sort of f- filed around the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. perimeter of the big living room. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Davenports, which, their couches, we called them, called them Davenports back then. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> Gotta learn a new language to talk <laughs> about the 50s. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so my dad would read scripture passage Mm -hmm. you know from the king james bible because that really was all that there was and then we would all pray during prayer we literally all you know turned and knelt down Mm -hmm. you know so our faces into Mm -hmm. the cushions of the couch and we all prayed but it was expected that it was expected that we all prayed Mm -hmm. and then oftentimes um you know during the weeknights our neighbors would be outside waiting for us to come out mm. you know and they'd be peeking in the windows and they knew you know so they, they knew what that you were yes and, and, and they never them, yeah. knocked on the door maybe you know because mm. if they did it once my dad would invite them in <laughs> which was very <laughs> awkward so they, they spread the news real fast yes don't, <laughs> don't ever knock after dinner exactly yeah, do not knock mm. they will come out when they're done so yeah. anyway i have to tell you one more thing okay. We did not have a TV. Very unusual. I mean, I don't know what year it was that TVs really kind of got invented. And then I'm sure there was a slow process of Mm -hmm. people around the country um, getting them. But by 1955, and then by the time I was in elementary school, you know, 1960 and then to 65. Anyway, everybody in the world had had a TV at that point. So for us to not have one was almost unheard of. Hmm. And so... remember one conversation well you know at school the kids would all there were very few things to watch okay so everybody watched the same things when they you know in the evening there was I can't even give you an example of what it was they were all watching but anyway so then the next day you know they would be talking about what they'd all seen and say did you see the blah 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 show and I said no we don't have a tv and this one little boy in sixth grade says to me well we don't have a roof on our house you know, what he was saying was, that is so important and so much a part of every home. How You're could you? clearly lying. Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, yeah, we mm-hmm. don't even have a roof on our house. Mm-hmm. You know, anyway, so just to, uh, my parents obviously intentionally um, did not have a TV, felt like it was a bad influence and they did mm-hmm. not want that yeah. in their home. And so we all um, grew up reading, mm-hmm. playing and reading. So we did. <laughs> Well, and there was a lot of music. There was a lot of musical lessons, a lot of piano lessons and piano mm-hmm. practicing and some of that. So so outside of the direct circle of, you know, church and youth group and all of that, you guys in some ways were a bit of a freak show. Yeah. You know, but within the church, or at least within your church, maybe even the broader evangelical community, did you feel more like the like poster like a poster child not necessarily you per se but your family did you feel like you guys were somewhat on display I mean, I think of this because you say you know you were always in the second row you were mm-hmm, there every time church mm-hmm. was going on and mm-hmm. um yeah you know compared to neighborhood kids or school you mm-hmm. know kids we were just pretty normal in the church okay. and interestingly so right behind us uh, as we sat in the second pew, there was another family called the Baileys, and they sat in the third pew. So they were right behind us. Um, there was another family <laughs> called the um, the Armadings, F- uh, five or six kids, Hansons, six or seven kids. Anyway, those were t- three other families that did not have TVs. Okay. okay the yeah. Baileys. Yeah. The Hansons and Armadings. And the also. Baileys being like your Tim Bailey. <laughs> yes, I did eventually yeah, family. meet yep. him sitting behind me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and Tim met like when you were kids then, really young. Yeah, he actually didn't move to Wheaton until uh, I think he was maybe in sixth grade. I think he was about 10 when his family moved. Okay. So, yes, I mean, he would have been sitting behind me when I was, you know, eight. Yeah. But I didn't. You know, you're not noticing boys yeah, or that other age families. Was, yeah. yeah, so and we didn't was, really meet until uh, high school youth yeah. group. 
And he was a couple years older than you anyway, right? Yes. So by the time I was a freshman, he was a junior. Okay. Now, he does remember having dinner at our house when he, you know, soon after they moved. <clears throat> and so he was pretty excited that they were going to eat dinner at a, you know, house of a family with a lot of kids. He was pretty excited about that. Mm-hmm. And it turned out to really not be very exciting. It was kind of a disappointment because we were all reading. <laughs> so... It's a very clear memory. <laughs> Chris, baby lacked social skills. And we did. I, I really think we did, yes. So with all of this context, where were you in your own faith? Or did you have faith? Or did you want faith? Or? Yes. I don't ever remember a time, you know, that I would have not believed everything that I was taught. I do, I guess, have a memory of, Backyard Bible Club, maybe when I was five or something, you know, praying the prayer and asking Jesus into my heart. Um, So I would say, yeah, all the way through elementary, junior high, I was just trying to do what you're supposed to do and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wasn't a problem. You know, I wasn't rebelling in my mind against anything. So Mm -hmm. really wasn't until I was in high school. Okay. That I was just, I wasn't really questioning the truth of scripture. I just was thinking, well, I personally just want to go have more fun. Okay. So. So what happened? To and you? I will say, yes, that was happening to all the rest of the kids in the youth group too. Mm. You know? And it wasn't okay. like we were going out and having drinking parties even. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Trying to even think what it was. We just didn't yeah. want to take our faith real seriously. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Were you following the rules or the guidelines set up by your parents? Okay. So one thing it would be kind of a expected dress, dress code for lack of another, mm-hmm. but an expectation of modesty, mm-hmm. you know, is absolutely a part of our home. Um, so I would wear skirts and roll them up after I left home, mm-hmm. after I left the house on the way to school. So that type of thing, mm-hmm. you know, just wanting to be, yeah, wanting to look a little more worldly at that point. Yeah, yeah. a little more normal. So I had bought a two-piece bathing suit, which wasn't really a bikini, but, you know, was definitely a two-piece bathing suit. And the youth group had a car wash. And mm-hmm. so I had my bathing suit on because, you know, we were all getting wet and it was a hot day and we're having fun. And my dad came to get his car washed and so he literally did not say anything to me he drove home and went into my room and into my dresser which he had I'm sure never done in my entire life and found clothing that he thought was appropriate and he brought them back to church (laughs) and gave them to me (laughs) so and again, it wasn't like he was, you know, he didn't get mad. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't make any kind of scene it about it or anything like that. It was just embarrassing and mortifying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that Thank was you. the yeah. kind of, and maybe with the older kids, there was more blatant discipline. By by the time we younger ones were mm-hmm. growing up, there was very little said. And some of that is that it's already clear to you yes. what the standard yes. is. The so, older kids have yeah. helped you get in mm-hmm. line. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, a friend of mine texted me a picture of a book, uh, this week and it's called Almost 12 by Kenneth and Taylor. And she said, did you know that your dad wrote a book about sex? <laughs> and I said, yes, because I was 12 when that book came out and it was easier for my father to write a book and give it to us than to talk to us. Mm-hmm. About sex. So, yeah, there's very little talking. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So this book was about adolescence and the yes. changes that your body yes. goes through yes. and yeah. all of that. Yeah. And I, I can <laughs> literally remember no conversation ever with either one of my parents. But this book suddenly... Didn't he, you know, like, initially have your picture on the front of it He did. Something, and then somebody changed it? He yeah, did. Tell that story. Let's okay. Yeah. So I was at school and... a. Uh, a boy that I knew um, went to a different church, but he came up and he was like, oh, ha, 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 you're on the you know cover of a book about sex. And I said, I do not know what you are talking about. And he, I don't know, if maybe the next day he literally brought in the magazine, which was probably a Christianity Today, um, and there was an ad for this book called Almost 12, and my picture was on it. 
<laughs> and I went home as a 12 year old. I was furious. Oh, I was yeah. like, what? To my dad, you know, which again, I, you know, in a home where we really didn't <clears throat> talk much, certainly, you know, but I'm sure I was crying and just saying, what is this? What are you mm. even thinking? How did this even happen? I was so upset that he called the publisher back and he said, I'm sorry, would you just all that, that whole, you know, how many boxes of mm. books you've got with my daughter's picture on it. We're just going to oh. recall all those oh, and put a different good. cover on. So it was very sweet, that actually. That is sweet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sympathy for his <laughs> embarrassed Spare you some yeah. childhood scarring. <laughs> exactly. Oh, wow. So, oh. Oh, <laughs> Pretty funny. so that so. leads to what your dad did. So tell us about, oh, tell okay. us more about family devotions okay. and okay. what that led yeah. to. Yeah. So because he was reading the King James Version to us every night and we we're all just like glassy eyed and, you know, during family devotions. Yes, yes, yes. So we're, you know, we're either not listening because it's so boring and we don't understand it anyway. So anyway, he was frustrated by that. And, you know, he would ask questions about what he had just read and the kids couldn't even answer it because they hadn't really understood it. So on the train on his way to work the next day. He worked at Moody Press in Chicago. And so on the train, he would take a a chapter of the Bible that we would be reading that night, and he would change it and rewrite it into Mm. a modern English so that his kids, we could understand it that night for family devotions. And he felt like it was really making a big difference in our ability to understand, Mm. you know, what scripture was about. So he got excited about it and thought it would be really good for a lot of people Mm. to be able to... um, have this um, available to them. So he kept on working and working and working, chapter after chapter, book after book. So he finished the um, epistles, Paul's epistles, and sent it to several publishers, you know, Christian publishing companies, called it Living Letters, you know, the letters of Paul. He, it was turned down by all the Christian um, publishing companies, including the publishing company he worked for, Moody Press, nobody could see that there would be a market for this. It Mm. was just a little too out there. And people were really, really committed to King James Version of Scripture. So he finally had to literally just borrow some money and print, you know, like Mm. maybe the first printing was 500 copies. And then he, you know, made a a one sheet advertisement for it and then got a, but I think he probably had to buy by a list of all the Christian bookstores in the country. Okay. And just send it to them. <clears throat> so he would, yeah. So he sent out these one page flyers, which was what we did when we were, so we were still in elementary school. Me and my sisters would sit on, in a row on the living room floor and fold them, you know, fold these flyers, stuff envelopes, and then um, lick them closed. And then I think my mom was typing labels and mm-hmm. um, putting them on. And then we were, you know, putting stamps on. And this was before the pre stick stamps, you know, you literally <laughs> lick yeah, every like stamp, tools. you know. <laughs> so, anyway, um, after an afternoon of doing that, my dad would take us out for an ice cream cone. So. <laughs> to soothe the poor tongue. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, so then the, the boxes of books got shipped to our house and they got stored in the garage. And then my brother, who was in junior high, would come home from school and, you know, he would have orders, you know, orders mm. had started to trickle mm. in, you know, one copy of this weird book called Living Letters Two, maybe somebody really went out on a limb and ordered five, you know, mm. um, to put in their Christian bookstores. But there was just enough interest, yeah. you know, that then he and he really, really believed in what he was doing. So he just continued to work every night. You know, he was in the bedroom after a full day of work. He yeah. would um, spend the evening up in his bedroom at a desk and um, continue to be working on his mm. paraphrase. So it was, it was a paraphrase. So I was in, I, think I was a senior in high school um, by the time the whole Bible came out. Mm. And it was called, you know, The Living Bible. And by this time, it was really a big, big deal. Okay. Um, yeah. And the whole Jesus movement had started and there was just... It was just selling and selling and selling. Uh, So now we have the Living Bible and the Message and Mm -hmm. many other paraphrases. Oh, so many, so many. But at that time, you're saying that this was was, it. That was the only one. So did that inspire then some of the other Bible translations? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, Yeah, I'm sure Mm -hmm. it would have. And then because your dad was unable to find a publisher initially, then he started his own publishing company. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so what, you know, was in our you know, living room, all the mm-hmm. mailings were going out from our living room. The, you know, the shipping was going out from our garage. 
the next door neighbor lady came over and was the secretary, you know. Uh, so, yes, it became wow. Tyndale House Publishers, you know, just right in our house yes. and is now, I think, probably the largest privately owned publishing, Christian publishing company in the country. Mm. So, wow, probably the world. Or, yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So, my yeah. dad had become very famous. Yeah. <clears throat> by that time. Um, and,. Very, just very, very well known. And that was annoying to me. And then the Baileys were also at your church. And yeah. Tim's dad also had a publishing. He worked house. for a publishing company. The reason he that he, that they moved to Wheaton was because he took a job no. at um, David C. Cook, which was a large, primarily Sunday school materials, not so much books. Okay. About, okay. Um, so tell us Sunday about those material. parallels between the houses, yeah. the homes you were growing yeah. up in. And then so, tell us about your first date. Oh, yeah, it was really interesting because the Baileys also were a fairly large uh, family and they also did not have TV and then and we went to the same church. Biggest difference was they didn't go to the evening service. So, um, yeah, I was always a little scandalized by that. <laughs> it's like, you what? <laughs> Don't go to evening Not services? Not Christians. <laughs> really? I know, but he was in the Boys Brigade, and then he, and he was in the same youth groups and everything. Um, <clears throat> so, mm-hmm. yeah, and so by the time I was a freshman and was kind of scoping out the boys in the youth group, um, and he was playing guitar, and he was a junior, he was an upperclassman, and he was so cute. So anyway, yeah, definitely, you know, had my eyes on him. Mm-hmm. Pretty early on there, um, and so and did he have his eyes on you at that point? Or? Yes, yeah. um, I I came home from school as a sophomore, and so I was I think I was fourteen, and um, my mom said to me, uh, "Tim Bailey is coming over this evening to take you out," and I'm like, "What?" I mean, this is so weird, but anyway, so he was being very proper and appropriate and called you know, our house to get permission from my parents. So he asked your wow. parents if he yes. could take you out before yes. he had asked you? Now my, yes. <gasps> my dad was out of town, so he had talked to my mom. So my mom <laughs> tells me I'm going out with Tim Bailey that night. <laughs> and <laughs> and so Tim didn't even drive. Okay, he didn't have his license. <laughs> and you were 14. <laughs> yeah, I was 14 and he was, I might so have been 13 and out? he was 15. So we went on a double date oh, okay. with a friend of his. Okay, and, I was um, trying to picture Nana. Yeah, no, no, no. So we uh, went to the movie, yeah. and so it happened to be Valentine's Day, and Tim did bring a rose with him when he came to pick me up. Oh, so anyway, friend of his was driving because, like I said, Tim didn't, didn't have his license. So that was our first date. And the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> so. so then in high school, you guys are sneaking out. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, he would come and throw stones at my window. and So and he started out all gentlemanly, yeah. and it kind of <laughs> derailed from there. <laughs> well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you started sneaking out at night, or what? Yeah, not, I yeah. mean, it wasn't like a reg- you know, regular thing, yeah. but we did. We would just run around the neighborhood, and I guess <clears throat> by that time he did have his license and his car. Old Volkswagen bug. <laughs> so yeah, he would drive quietly up the driveway, and usually had a friend with him, and he'd get in, and then we would go get a friend of mine, and yeah. just run around town. And so yeah. So then, by the time he graduated from high school, you were still what, just a junior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what happened then? So he spent one year at Columbia Bible College, but he just spent one year there. So he moved out to California. At some point, I decided during my senior year, probably pretty early on, that I was going to go to Westmont College in California. So my goal was to get away from home, get out of Wheaton, get as far away from home as I could go. And California, you know, pretty cool place. So Westmont was a Christian school. You were starting to resent or not like so much the Christian home you were growing up in? Right. Okay. And so that plays into your wanting to get, get yeah. Go I really, far away. I just Can really wanted that? to have yeah. some fun. Okay, you know, there's a beach. Things were just too serious. Meet at new home. boys. Yeah, yeah. But okay, so Tim moved out to California that year and got a job in preparation for me to come out to California and be in school. Okay, so we had this plan. Okay, we both be in California. Mm-hmm. By the time I got out there for school, I was ready to break up with him. Mm. 
because if I was going to have fun, <laughs> I wanted to have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want to feel tied down. So yeah, I broke up with him and he eventually went back to Illinois and went to school. So I, I spent that whole freshman year kind of doing the fun, mm-hmm. you know, thing, which got really old really fast. So what um, did that look like? Oh, a lot of going to the beach, a lot of dating, a lot of... And it wasn't real, it wasn't like big partying because again, it was a Christian school. I'm sure there was a fair, a certain amount of drinking. Um, I was never into drinking. So, so you said you wanted to get as far away from possible. Do you think part of that was to go to a place where you wouldn't be recognized as the daughter of Ken Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. I went with someone else from Wheaton. We drove out together anyway. So she was very excited to know the daughter of Ken Taylor. So she wanted to introduce me as, and you know who her dad is, Mm -hmm. you know, this is Mary Lee, Mary Lee Taylor and her dad is Ken Taylor. He wrote the living Bible. So she was very excited about that. And I was just like, always rolling my eyes and just saying, Oh, please, would you just shut up? Mm -hmm. You know, is that was the part I wanted to just kind of leave behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I would just say I was never, disbelieving scripture uh-huh. you know it wasn't like I was ever questioning was there a God I just sure. didn't want to deal with it and think about it yeah you just so, yeah think about myself think about yourself and yep. have fun and yep. your family was a hindrance to that yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah. so what happened after your first year of college my second year I went to um England for a semester okay. and then San Francisco for an urban studies program. Now that was really the first time I would say that some serious seeds were planted questioning um, scripture mm. because there was a professor that was in charge of the urban um, studies program in San Francisco that was from Westmont, but he had fully intentions to plant seeds of doubt mm. from all these, you know, what he would have considered you know, naive and innocent and sheltered, you know, little goody, goody Christians. And he was just going to open all of our eyes, you know? So he, you know, he had some, a couple of gay guys come in and we had a, you know, a night just um, talking about scripture and why scripture didn't really, um, was not really against homosexuality. And these guys were there to, you know, Mm -hmm. sort of be a living exhibition of quote, Christian you know, gay people. Mm -hmm. And so they knew all the right scriptures to take you to, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. and to explain, you know, that Sodom was not um, burned because it was full of homosexuals that wanted to rape the angels. What it was, the problem was that they were inhospitable. So that was the sin, was the inhospitality. Mm -hmm. And so that type of thing, you know. So, uh, so that was one of the things, one of them was, they, he, he told us this long story one evening about um, a, a woman who had had an affair. She was a pastor's uh, wife, um, but she was very unhappy in her marriage. She'd had an affair. She was pregnant. Um, but she actually realized at that point she really did want to go back to her husband and, you know, really try. But she didn't want to admit that she was pregnant. And so it was just this huge, you know, emotional dilemma. You know, he just, you know, he just tells the story on and on. And you're just so sucked into the, you know, the horror of her life. Mm. And so really the only obvious thing was for her to have an abortion. Mm. And so the end of the story is he took her. Mm. It makes me cry right now. You know, it's like so he had us just wrapped around his, mm. you know, had us in the palm of his hands, you know, mm-hmm. listening just to the story. Manipulating yeah, all yeah, these yeah. Christian kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let's see, so is in 73, I think, that Roe versus Wade had happened. Mm-hmm. And really, the Christian church was pretty silent. Mm-hmm. There was not a lot being said. Just entirely unprepared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There just was not much happening. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So even though it's sort of in the back of your mind, you would all have like, oh no, no, that's, that's bad. You know, we all somehow just like, we knew that was bad, you know, mm-hmm. but you know, as soon as he would tell you this story about, you know, it was really this, the only answer. Mm-hmm. It was the compassionate thing mm-hmm. was to help her get an abortion. So anyway, this is the type of thing. He literally had, you know, some prostitutes come in and exposed us to, you know, sort of the realities of life. And again, let's not, let's just not be judgmental. You know, Mm -hmm. these are really normal people that just happen to be 
living, choosing this lifestyle or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so our entire semester was um, filled with that type of thing. And this was technically a Christian college, you said? Yeah. Yeah. And so you started buying into this. Yeah. 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 So, and also I think that the entire culture had... Again, like Michael had mentioned earlier on, it was just kind of happening in the whole sexual revolution, you know, was happening. And sort of a whole within the church, you know, more of a sort of an egalitarian understanding of let's, we really need to leave the 50s behind. Mm. You know, we can be um, progressive and move, leave all mm. of that. And so all of that type of thinking, you just don't even know where it's coming from, but you're just like, it's just in the air that we breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, it was then, it is now, you don't even realize how much of it you're, you know, sucking in. And so, yeah, that was absolutely happening too. Were you talking with your parents at all about the stuff that you were hearing? No, no. You know what? I I did write some letters home because my dad almost came and pulled me out of school. (laughs) (laughs) They were paying. (laughs) <laughs> and they did send me to a Christian school, really expecting it to be um, Christian. <laughs> Christian, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, my dad would almost almost pulled me out of school. So yeah. So um, just to clarify, you came to college not wanting to be known as Ken Taylor's daughter anymore, right? And within a year or two, you had succeeded at least somewhat because you said that you were one of the women who was asked to begin mm-hmm, to mm-hmm, start mm-hmm. this. Women's, was it called a women's center? It was. Tell us about that. Okay. (laughs) Again, there's this big movement around across the country, um, probably primarily at universities. Mm -hmm. um, But I don't know, it's just like this big deal where there would be a room, a place, you know, on campuses called the women's center, which would be maybe stocked with books and pamphlets and, you know, primarily things like um, birth control books called Our Bodies, Ourselves, um, but, you know, pretty much feminist literature. Mm -hmm. And then this was going to be a place where women could sort of feel comfortable and be accepted. And Mm -hmm. so I had become well enough known on campus of sort of being different and being, you know, sort of independent or whatever. So I had been asked to go, you know, start this women's center. Mm -hmm. That was my junior year. So when I had come back after my whole year of being off campus, that was what I was involved with okay. until I was really just tired of the whole thing and left, quit. Tired of what whole thing? Oh, just tired of school, tired of the life I was living. And Tim and I were, you know, in communication throughout all of this, mm-hmm. you know, but not dating because I still wanted the freedom to date. Mm-hmm. So anyway, but I did. I just quit school one day. So what'd you do? Where'd you go? I drove up to San Francisco, but I didn't have any money. So I think I knew somebody, well, I had lived in San Francisco, you know, the summer of the year before that, because I'd gone to that urban studies program. So I knew people in San Francisco. I left my car there because I didn't have enough money for gas. And then I hitchhiked up to Salem, Oregon, because I had a sister that lived in Salem who was in the middle of a divorce. And so she was, had been going through her own rebellion and hard times. Mm. And so when I got up there, um, stayed with her and just said, let's not call mom and dad. Mm. And she agreed with me that we would not call mom and dad um, and tell them where I was. I don't even know why. So how did your parents find out? Uh, Because my dad was making a business trip to California and called Westmont because he wanted to come visit me on campus. And my, of course, you know, this was back when there were, Um, one phone, you know, on a whole dorm floor. Mm -hmm. My roommate had to say, she's not here. She quit school and we don't know where she is. How my parents found out. And how long until they um, figured out where you were? It was probably just a couple weeks before my sister knew somebody, you know, that actually knew my parents. And they came over and said, would you please... Please call your parents. Yeah. They should know where you are. I mean, even just a couple so, of weeks would be Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Terrifying for parents. Yeah. So how long did you stay with your sister? Oh, okay. So that was in the middle of the fall semester and maybe f- sort of early on because when I was talking to Tim and he said that he was actually going to invite a girl from school he was going to DeKalb. He went to DeKalb University. Which in, is where? It's in Illinois. 
Okay. So anyway, so he was meeting a whole different, you know, realm of friends and people. Yeah. And, and he had met a nice girl? Yeah, he did. He oh. met a nice girl and he was going to invite her home for Thanksgiving. Huh. And I thought, yeah, huh. <laughs> that is not part of the plan. <laughs> the you're plan, supposed to just wait on right, me. <laughs> yes, the plan is I'm going to have fun and you're going to wait. You know, as soon as there was kind of this indication that he wasn't waiting. Yeah. I was ready to go back home. <laughs> so I had to go back so down. I had to hitchhike back down to San Francisco to get my car. car. But I, yeah, I was ready to reclaim my boyfriend, Tim Bailey. <laughs> and how did that go? Yeah, he was ready to drop everything and everybody and take me back. And his parents were so disgusted. They had had it with me. But I wasn't ready to, you know, Tim was in school. This was just Christmas break from school. I had quit school. I had actually gotten a job in Salem, Oregon. So I was ready to, you know, after Christmas, when I go back um, to my job. So he and I drove. He drove with me um, across country. Okay. So this is again, yeah, to get me back there. So this is kind of a a little bit of an enigma also because my parents were so conservative and would never, you know, like normally have just like let these two single people who were dating drive across country together. I mean, does Mm -hmm. that not sound bizarre? Mm -hmm. You know, but for one, again, I was the ninth. And so they were a little tired. Mm Mm-hmm. And I had had a brother that had just literally, you know, disappeared and uh, from the family. Mm -hmm. So I think they were very, very felt very burned, very cautious, Mm -hmm. didn't know really what to do. You know, they didn't want to alienate you. Yeah. Yeah. So we were and we were. How did they feel? We weren't asking for permission either. You know, we were just kind of go, well, this is our plans we're going to do. And they Mm -hmm. were just like, okay, you know, guess we have to go along with that. Sounds crazy. And I would say in some ways we were probably similar at that point we're having a good time okay our faith is just on the back burner so anyway so we drive across country he goes back to school uh within a few weeks i was waking up throwing up it's like huh that's interesting and so i took pregnancy test and it was positive so i had to call tim at school and say so i'm pregnant so we just started making plans right away to get married, mm-hmm. which, of course, he'd been wanting to do for years. You know, I was, <laughs> I was the one who was up. Up until that point, if he ever talked about getting married, I was just like, oh, no. Mm-hmm. It was just, in fact, even at that point, I'm saying we talked about, started talking about getting married, but really, I was still not interested in getting married. I was committed to being with him at that point, Mm -hmm. you know, that we were going to have a baby together. Mm -hmm. But what I was suggesting was that we buy bikes and uh, ride down the coast for Oregon and California because that sounded cool. (laughs) I'm morning sick. Let's go for a bike ride. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, again, money you know, it's like we had to buy bikes. We didn't own bikes. We were, you know, where were we getting money? I mean, the yeah. whole thing. I was just so, so mm. unrealistic and impractical and ridiculous. But anyway, fortunately, Tim was a little more practical and <laughs> already was starting to be more biblically minded. Okay. okay. He was like, no, nope, we're not going to do that. We are not even going to be together unless we get married. Mm. So it's like, okay, well, if I have to be married to be with you, then I'll get married. But mm-hmm. it wasn't what I wanted to do. Real quick, mm-hmm. what was it like for you guys to tell your parents that you were pregnant? Well, mortifying, mm-hmm. um, scary, embarrassing. So we... And how did they respond? Well, my parents are very quiet people. Uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> there weren't actually a lot of words. But my father, again, he had been out of town. We had gotten home um, to Wheaton. And then my dad got to... got into Wheaton after we were there. I just remember him, you know, the sort of this anticipation of my dad's getting home, my dad's getting home. But you already, mm. but he already knew. He did already know. And that you guys yeah. were getting married. Yeah. And so but we you were, were going to be seeing there him There was the this first anticipation time. of, and Tim and he, you know, went for a walk. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, can, you know, sort of confronting Tim mm-hmm. for having gotten his daughter pregnant, mm-hmm. you know. And then... I mean, we were really getting married very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, Like we were, we were getting married within a few days of getting home. So Mm -hmm. I think like the day after my dad got home, we got married. Mm -hmm. We were probably just waiting for him to Mm -hmm. get home. And so we just, you know, there's this idea that you could get married at College Church because that's where we grew up. Both of our families were from there. 
And I don't remember who had this idea that that was sort of inappropriate. You know, why would we just have this big, you know, wedding as if we were just like everybody else? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. when when I was pregnant, we had already like sort of committed what felt like the unforgivable sin. Were you at a place in your faith where you felt like shame for that for getting pregnant out of wedlock? Or was it more like having to tell your parents and the shame of who your family was and that kind of thing. Yeah, that was really more yeah. the reality. But we were, we really did confess that. We really, we were repentant. Maybe Tim was a little more than I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a sense that, you know, sort of uh, there was a um, sense of modesty that we should do something a little differently, you know. Mm-hmm. So we just got married in my parents' house. Um, there were probably, you know, 50 people there you know, just folding chairs in the living room. My mom made a cake. So it's very, very um, low key, small, very sweet, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, just very, very sweet. Both of our parents, both of our fathers were doing the ceremony. Tim's dad was actually the one who did the marrying. And he had told us beforehand that he wouldn't marry us if we would ever gonna if we were ever gonna consider divorce so he must have had that conversation with Tim because then Tim came and told me dad won't marry us if we're gonna ever talk about divorce and I said well you know (laughs) nobody thinks they're gonna get divorced when they're getting married but of course it just does happen I already had siblings who were divorced Mm -hmm. you know and so I just thought this is something that just happens to people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you don't plan it it happens so how could we possibly say we will never get divorced. Mm. That just seemed ridiculous. And Tim said, well, my dad won't marry us if we don't agree to that. Mm. So it's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> so we, we agreed to that. But it did actually set us off on a very, very um, good mindset. Mindset. Of, yeah. We had agreed we wouldn't consider it, which meant if you didn't, if you weren't going to consider it, you would never talk, talk about, about it. it yeah. You could never threaten it. Mm-hmm. You couldn't say, I want a divorce. I wish we'd get divorced. You, you know, it's just, it was not a word that was ever yeah. mentioned. That's pretty um, cool. So yeah. that was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so you know, I think what? the Lord just kind of had his hand on us yeah. um, very early on. And Tim was pretty committed. You know, he just like, I don't know, it's just like a light bulb, you know, turned on for him. Hmm. He just switched gears. You know, it's like, okay, actually, now if we're going to get married and we're going to have a baby, we are going to get in a church. Church. Mm-hmm. We are going to find a church and we are going to get committed to it. And he had been reading Life Together by Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer was, you know, writing in Germany during Second World War where the mm-hmm. whole church had gone underground. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, you know, if you are in a church, praise God, mm-hmm. you know, be glad and just get plugged in and commit to mm-hmm. it. Don't be wandering around trying to find the perfect church. You know, mm-hmm. so anyway, so Tim had latched onto that mm-hmm. and we visited a few churches and then just decided, hey, there's one here in our neighborhood. Yeah. Seems pretty cool. Let's go there. Yeah. So, yeah, we started going to a small church right near where we lived. And, you know, within a few weeks, we went and offered to be the youth group leaders because youth group, <laughs> our youth group had been so instrumental mm-hmm. in our lives when we were in College Church in Wheaton that we were really committed to mm-hmm. youth groups. Mm -hmm. and um, Mm -hmm. what they could mean and what they could do in the lives of young people. You know, so I had a pierced nose, which was really unheard of back then. I mean, I had been in San Francisco. So in California, you know, a few people were starting to do it. But in the West, nobody, Midwest, nobody had ever seen, Mm -hmm. you know, a pierced nose. Um, Tim had a pierced ear. He had long hair. His hair was longer than mine, you know, at that point, (laughs) shoulder length. So anyway, but we were just, you know, wanted to get plugged into the church and offered to do their youth group. And I guess they were desperate enough that they said yes. I mean, they barely knew us and we looked really, you know, (laughs) whatever. But, you know, so we started getting involved in the church. In the meantime, though, we had not decided that egalitarian marriages didn't work. We were very committed to having an egalitarian marriage, whatever that meant. I mean, we didn't really have any 
you know, blueprint. We Mm -hmm. just had this idea that we weren't going to be like our parents. We weren't going to be like the 50s. We weren't going to be all stodgy. We weren't going to be traditional. You know, Mm -hmm. we weren't going to be real conservative. So there weren't these rules and these particular roles that you were stepping into as you got married. We only knew what we were. Yeah, we only knew what we were leaving behind was everything traditional. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so it's interesting as I had really embraced feminism, I wasn't really committed to the idea of a career. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't mind, you know, that I was going to be a mom and even wanted to stay at home, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So that part of what was happening in the culture wasn't part of my mindset. But what we were going to do at you home. You were cherry picking. I was. I think you were absolutely, cherry picking. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, um, but so we didn't really know what it looked like or what it meant. To have this quote egalitarian marriage, which was like this sort of this big thing that it swept through the church, mm-hmm. you know, everybody was going to be egalitarian, mm-hmm. and um, so really, what it meant for us is that we had to fight. We had to fight about everything mm-hmm. because we didn't know who was supposed to do what. You know, whether it was any kind of housework, you know, and dishes, or you know, by then we'd had a baby, and who was changing diapers, or who was who was cooking, or who was taking care of cars. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we could fight about anything mm-hmm. and did about all those things. I mean, we would take walks and we would fight about who was setting the pace for walking. You know, Tim had longer legs than me. He he walked faster and I was kind of irritated that I was having to sort of work to keep up with him and why mm-hmm. didn't he just walk slower? You know, I mean, just like literally we could fight about, about everything. everything. Yeah. So, um, so were you like... What have I done with my life? <laughs> like, <laughs> sort of. were you both wanting out, kind of thing? But you weren't talking divorce, right? You right, gonna, right. So. You know, I really, I don't think either one of us really wanted out. Yeah, but it would be nice to figure out better how to do this thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, so then Tim is starting, as I said, always a step ahead of me. So he's he's reading and starting to understand this thing. Basically, you know, biblical manhood and biblical manhood and womanhood Mm -hmm. and what that might look like. And so, you know, as we would talk about it, I was still really chafing and resenting and kind of fighting with that whole idea of like, why? Why Mm -hmm. in the world would Mm -hmm. he be be the one to say what we were going to be doing? Why in the world would I have to submit to what he thought or what he wanted? Anyway, so it was... A long process, Mm -hmm. I think, Mm -hmm. of both of us coming to, you know, better understand. So, yeah, I mean, it definitely took a while for him to learn Mm -hmm. what it would look like for a truly biblical husband and father. And I was slowly coming to understand that submission could be a positive thing. It would be it was something that was actually planned by God, Mm -hmm. you know, and given to married couples as a gift, in which ways, you know, I could sort of understand that because we had tried to do the other. (laughs) Right. So at some point, was there sort of like this light bulb moment where you were like, oh, actually, what we saw our parents doing was just biblical, living out biblical truth. It wasn't even just like this cultural thing that, you know, culture is rejecting and we all want to throw off, but realizing like, oh, no, this is really just what the Bible says. Um, no, I would say no okay. for me, especially yeah. there was not a light bulb moment. It was, yeah. a it was very, a very slow, very slow mm-hmm. um, process mm-hmm. that, you know, I think the Lord was just very merciful and mm-hmm. gracious and drew mm-hmm. me along, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, it's like, okay, well, here I am married 45 years. I'm not like, oh, yay. You know, yippee. <laughs> yippee I get submission. To <laughs> My favorite. (laughs) Right. You know, I think every married woman, you know, has some degree of, you know, resentment or fighting against that, you know, most of her life at, you know, at least Mm -hmm. at certain points. Well, and I remember you saying in some interview we did in the past, it's not really submission if it's easy, if we want to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Elizabeth Elliot that said, it's not submission until you disagree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, yeah. and I think so often, you know, we think, well, why do women get the hard part of submitting? Mm-hmm. And we don't realize the weight of responsibility that the men are yeah. carrying. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, submission is not just for women. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's interesting, Chris, through the years, we've known a lot of men who wanted to really, you know, sort of wield the submission sword, you know, over his mm-hmm. wife and uh, make a big deal out of that she's supposed to submit. 
But of course, they're not just going into the very next verse, which is, and husbands love your wives like Christ loves the church. The other thing is, you know, they want their wives and their children to submit to them, but they are under no authority. They refuse to, you know, be under the authority of any church. And that's, you know, obviously they can't have a good relationship of, you know, headship and submission with their wife if they don't even understand submission themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So anyway, it's just a big ball of all these different relationships intertwining, but the Lord is sovereign and overall and he made the plan. You know, one of the things that, you know, feminists in the church often want to say is like, yes, but that was after the fall. You know, that is because of the fallen world that we have this thing called, you know, headship and leadership and submission. Mm. But it's not. That was before the fall, Mm. you know, that Mm -hmm. God created Adam first, created Eve for Adam, you know, to be a helpmate, you know. And that was true before the fall and after the fall and yet today. And Mm -hmm. we're still trying to work it out. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? You know, what exactly does it mean? And it really means something different in every single marriage. Mm -hmm. Every single relationship Mm -hmm. is different because it's two different people. Mm -hmm. You know, no husband is exactly the same as the next husband. No wife is exactly. So what works for one couple is not going to work for the next couple. You know, Mm -hmm. so like we had been told years ago, you know, it's like, what? Your wife does the finances? That is terrible. You know, as the leader and head of the family, you need to do, you know, pay the bills and be in charge of finances. And we're like, what? Why? Yeah. <laughs> it That's works more this works my for us. Strength, you know? yeah. <laughs> my wife remembers to pay the bills. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's super but, important in bill you paying. Know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> so, anyway, again, you want to just submit it to the Lord. So I just want to say, yeah, so I think that the Lord drew us both um, slowly um, through the years to himself and to a good understanding of what we should be doing and what does it mean um, to have a Christian marriage and what does it look Mm -hmm. like to be a leader Mm -hmm. and how to submit. Um, I know one of the stories I had told at some point that you reminded me of was when we were going to move from Wisconsin to Indiana and I did not want to move. Well, um, set up the, the the context of now Tim is a pastor at this point, right? Oh, yeah, that's sort of important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because that was also not a good, not not my plan. Okay. so For Tim to become yeah. a pastor. <laughs> right. So, okay, so we had only been married for a couple years, though, when he says he wants to go to uh, seminary. And it's like, wait, what? So he had just graduated from um, his undergrad. And then I'm like, again, I'm ready to like, okay, this is cool. Let's do something fun. We're, we're free from school. Let's go join a Christian commune. That'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, which if you've ever read anything about Christian communes from back in the 70s, they were an absolute nightmare. That was still kind of this, you you know, utopian idea that I had okay. um, that we could go do something like that. But anyway, so... He did actually want to break from school, though. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was wanted to actually to do an internship, work in a church for a year, which his dad was able to set up for us to do. And at that point, I took my nose ring out and he took his earring out. We decided we really kind of had to look the part, you know, <laughs> at that point. We were going to go to a very, you know, traditional um, big yeah. church. So I had to adjust to the idea that he said he wanted to be a pastor. And again, that would have been like the like the very bottom of any list put together would have been at the bottom mm. of my list of things that I wanted him to do. But he um, was pretty committed at this point to going down that path. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going with you. So, mm-hmm. um, so we did Boulder for a year and then Gordon-Conwell um, for three years. That was seminary? Yeah, that was seminary. Okay. Then he got his first um, pastorate in Wisconsin. We were in a small town called Partyville for eight years. And when he was feeling oh, just antsy, maybe, um, ready to be challenged in different ways, um, loved, loved, loved our people there Mm -hmm. and learned so much to begin ministry but he was you know just starting to feel ready to and how about for you well for me I was absolutely committed to staying in Partyville you you liked it there I did and it was you kind of fallen into the pastor's wife groove I mean were you you liking that or it was a little weird but yes I when we moved there I was expected to teach the uh, women's bible study 
Okay. Mm. Every woman in there was over 70. There was literally a table of probably oh, a dozen women over 70. And I was, what, 30? Yeah. You know, and they were just like, well, you're the pastor's wife. This is what you do. So, yeah, I did, you know, just sort of feel like I really, I was committed to being part of Tim's ministry. So, but I, yeah, I would, I had absolutely fallen in love with this tiny town. Okay. Mm-hmm. This town had like 1500 people in it and <laughs> it was like five blocks long. And, you know, you could walk to the bank, to the post office, to the grocery store, to the elementary school, well, to the dentist, to the doctor. have a little bit sense of that commune kind of yeah, feel yeah, that yeah. you were wanting. You got what you wanted after all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then um, beyond the confines of the town, which was just farms. Okay. And so a lot of our um, parishioners were farmers. Yeah. I just loved it. And our, mm-hmm. our kids, of course, we had, what, three? Um, kids had, you know, very good friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was not ready to move at all. Anyway, this church down in Bloomington, Indiana, had contacted Tim and said, you know, would you be willing to come down and we're looking for a pastor, would you consider? And so he was ready to do that. Hmm. You know, it's like, wait, what? Why would we even go down there? Because we're not, not, we're not willing to move. We're not talking about moving. You know, we're not looking. <laughs> Are we? And he <laughs> yeah. said, well, it'll be a good weekend off. Let's mm. just go because it'll be kind of fun. Yeah. So we did. And then as we were pulling out of Bloomington to go back home to Wisconsin, he stopped at the visitor center. You know, we go in and he's like pulling out brochures about the area. And it's like, what are we doing? I just, so, but I was starting to think, whoa. Yeah, like maybe he's a maybe, little more yeah, serious maybe than he Maybe he's on. really <laughs> thinking about this. And yeah. then we got home and again, I was really kicking against this idea that we were going to move. And so, um, and I remember calling Barb Hughes once because um, her husband was actually the one, Kent Hughes was the one that had given this church in Indiana, Tim's name is Possibility, as, mm-hmm. you know, somebody to pursue. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the Hugheses, but Kent Hughes had been the pastor of College Church in Wheaton, but only after we had left there. Okay, okay. so he wasn't ever our pastor, mm-hmm. but we knew them, we'd gotten to be friends with them. So anyway, and I knew that when they had moved to Wheaton, it had been a big, big, huge move for them because mm-hmm. they had been in California. They were just, you know, real Californians okay. and they had teenagers that did not want to move. And, you know, it's just a, so it was there hard. was a lot you could identify. Yeah. With her so over, I thought, yeah. yes, I could identify with mm-hmm. that. What I had known about that story and I knew she would be able to identify with me struggling to Mm. think about how to do this move to Indiana and whether or not we even should, because I was really trying to help him figure out because if there was this, then this, and if there was this, then there was this, Mm -hmm. and it was just, it was complicated and we just didn't know. And it was, you know, so it was all trauma. I called Barb Hughes and I explained this whole thing to her and how complicated and difficult it was to figure out. And she finally just, you know, I finally paused long enough for her to say something. And and she says, well, it's just not your decision, is it? Oh, that was not what I was expecting. It wasn't what I wanted, you know, but she just completely, you know, sort of shut me down with all of my, you know, trauma. So anyway, I think that probably was something that the Lord used to help me Mm -hmm. start to rethink, you know, the way I needed to be thinking about this. And then it really, by the end, it, I had to even admit, it really was clear that the Lord was taking us to this new church in Bloomington. It was interesting, Barb, having a good understanding of headship and submission, and yeah. I needed to follow my husband. Well, of yeah. course, I wasn't going to stay behind, but, you know, I wanted to convince right. him that he just was Just emotionally and just yeah. in your own heart. Yeah. 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 Just another step in the process of Mm -hmm. God Mm -hmm. humbling you and softening Mm -hmm. you and Mm -hmm. changing your heart if we could just be practical enough you know yeah um that this could all just be laid out on the table and all these you know charts and figure it Mm -hmm. out and we could both just be rational we'll come (laughs) to this understanding you know that wasn't really the way it ever works and Tim really just was getting more and more drawn to um this move yeah so it's like it's a better get in line here yeah so and it really wasn't very long before I and my kids were happy to be in Bloomington mm-hmm. so that's neat and then it's just I mean obviously many more things have happened in your mm-hmm. life but just thinking of where you are now is pretty cool to hear all of that background and then you know 
to see and think of the ministry that you and Tim do now, which is so much centered around teaching biblical manhood and womanhood. And it's pretty cool what God has done in you guys' life to bring you to this point and to give you the ministry he's given you. Yeah, and I am very thankful for that. And it is just Mm -hmm. sort of funny, you know, having just talked about all those, you know, years that if I try to put myself back in that place and then try to imagine, you know, where I am now, it's just like, no, yeah, I would never, (laughs) no, that could not be, (laughs) that could not happen. So, yeah, Yeah, sometimes God likes to write. Yeah, (laughs) yes, exactly. Sometimes I think about the people that I did know back, you know, in college, you know, and just and try to think about them imagining me where I am right now, that they would also be like, what? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. <laughs> Did she have a head injury? <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, very thankful that the Lord has been very patient and um, just kept his hand on us and brought us to where we are. This episode of Monumental was hosted by Katie Walker and Michael Crone. It is produced and edited by Katie Walker, and it is executive produced by Nathan Alberson and Jake Menzel. If you like the show, please don't forget to rate and review in the app of your choice. And if you're interested in more great content, including articles and other podcasts, please visit warhornmedia.com.